All right. Welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope everyone had a nice little short break there. Um, excited for the next next panel discussion here. We've got several folks ready to talk about the, the impact of COVID-19 on the construction industry and our construction workforce. Um, I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, but uh, just for quick names, we've got Jeff Wall, uh, Jeremy Holland, and Joe Kernkamp, so the three J's. Um, we've got some questions prepared for folks, but please, as things come up or you hear what our panel's talking about, please feel free to put questions in the chat box. Um, and we'll try to get to those towards the end of this, but uh, wanted to get some different perspectives on how this last year has really changed how we do construction work um, and what that that has done to our workforce. And so um, to kick us off here, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. And I'd like to hear, you know, we often think about COVID-19 as a negative thing. I'd like to hear each of them talk a little bit about what's the, the one thing they've appreciated most about the last year and the the change in how we're working and how we're living and just uh, the, the impact on our lives. And so uh, why don't we start with Joe and then we'll go to Jeremy and then to Jeff. Thank you, Matt. Good morning. Uh, quick introduction, Joe Kernkamp, president of APSCO, uh, equipment supplier here for the greater Northwest. And really for me, the, the, the silver lining of COVID has been just the time at home with my family. I spent the last 20 years of my career traveling and for the first time ever, I've not been on an airplane since early February. I've been home with my two young boys. We've, we've ridden our bikes, we've played catch, we've cooked meals at home together. Uh, so it's, it's really been a special year for me in that regard. So uh, I'm grateful for this experience in, in so many ways. Great, thanks Joe. Jeremy? He stole mine. What am I supposed to be thankful for now? <laughs> Um, I, similar to, to Joe, uh, first of all, Jeremy Holland uh, with Mortensen Construction. Um, and I, I saw, you know, looking at the list of folks that are participating, recognize a lot of names. So hello to everybody. Uh, I spent the last 25 years before joining Mortensen in the engineering world with a few different firms and uh, joined Mortensen a little over a year ago as, as market executive. So kind of focus on, on business the business side of things. Um, and so I guess instead of talking about family, because it's been, that's certainly been an amazing opportunity. Uh, I will say it's been also really a blessing in disguise to start a new role somewhere because that's been, um, it's been a different experience. It's been interesting as far as how that uh, transition has occurred and a, the bulk of it being virtual. And so it's, it's caused, caused people to do some flexing, caused me to do some flexing as far as interacting with people virtually and, and uh, you know, building relationships within a company and, and externally virtually. So it's uh, help, helped me flex some different kinds of muscle uh, along the way, I guess you could say. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Jeff, you want to give a quick intro? I know you've uh, you've introduced yourself already, but maybe a little background on, on your role and, and what you appreciate about the last year. Sure. Uh, Jeff Wall, Vice President of Slayton Constructors, as well as Senior Project Manager. Spend a lot of time doing business development as well as being engaged in projects. And, you know, it's the same thing that I've enjoyed over the past year is developing further relationships with family and friends and coworkers. Uh, spending the time at home doing more relational things like board games rather than uh, going to a movie or, or just being active. Rather, we're spending the time getting to know each other and learning more about each other. So it's, it's been great in that regard. All right, maybe first question then, you know, um, kind of a broad question here. How, how has COVID and the ongoing pandemic affected your ability to deliver projects for your clients? Jeremy, maybe you want to kick us off here. So I would say the first easy answer would be it hasn't, um, which I mean, it's not entirely true, obviously. But I mean, one thing that's been kind of the reality with our work is it hasn't stopped. Um, and so, again, that's been um, a blessing because there's certain industries that have been impacted, even in the construction industry, you know. Um, Mortensen has a large um, hospitality market sector and uh, you know that part of our business obviously people aren't traveling anymore they're not staying in hotels there's not a lot of demand for that so that that part of the business has, has had to adjust water wastewater that's that's uh, you know full speed ahead so I would say from that from that perspective it hasn't but 
certainly what you have to do to, to adapt to that has, has been the thing. So what, what, our, what our companies have had to deal with to maintain schedule and, and keep people busy and, and safe, that's the, the area where there's been a lot of focus. Jeff, any thoughts from your end? Yeah. So again, uh, it hasn't been earth shattering on our side as well. We've had to scramble a few times. Uh, we have a, a pretty large project, $50 million project on a very tight time frame where our general superintendent has had to stay home for almost a month now uh, dealing with COVID. So we've scrambled to get the right people out there to fulfill his role and figure out how to get him engaged via Zoom or Teams. Uh, we've had startup of equipment that's been impacted where individuals can't travel from Germany to perform startup. So we've used uh, teams to do components of the startup. And we've had travel restrictions between states for startup to uh, get the, the reps here to start up the equipment. So we've learned you got to plan for some of these situations and get approval from uh, the cities to have these people travel between states. Joe, I know you're you're heavily involved in the equipment startup, and Jeff was kind of mentioning that. Any uh, different perspective from your end, you know, supplying equipment to these projects? You know, cer certainly the 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 effect of it has been that certain people thought we would be, you know, kind of shut down. The reality is, uh, water wastewater has not stopped flowing, so the work keeps going on, and so finding a way to execute that work and and kind of have employee buy-in that that's what we do and, and reassure everybody that we're doing it in a safe way. Um, but really the startup, as Jeff pointed out, what's been the hardest, right? It's just um, whether it's, uh, you know, personal safety um, risk evaluations or regulate regulatory issues between states um, or countries for that matter. Uh, we have people coming in from Canada or Germany it's just really created logistics challenges and timing to get things executed and, and started up when we needed to. We've, we've had, like Jeff mentioned, we've done some remote startups, uh, which creates a challenge on both ends. And it's a, it's a new and very uncomfortable way to start up equipment because you really lose a lot of the key senses that you need when starting up equipment, right? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? You know, all those things you can't get through this experience uh, that mean a lot when you're, when you're doing some, you know, really expensive machinery. So. Those are probably the biggest challenges. Have, have you all found anything that helped? You know, it sounds like startups a major issue. Any anything that you've seen that really helps with that, aside from just kind of the the virtual meetings or a little bit of pre planning? Well, I mean, technology is huge, and you know, I especially thinking about startup. I've had a few of uh, you know episodes or involvement in that, and the ability to at least have somebody on a screen doing whether it's FaceTime or a Teams meeting. And if they can't be there physically, at least they can see what's going on and you can communicate in real time. Because honestly, there's been some circumstances where I didn't, if I didn't have a somebody on the other end that could participate with me, I, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to figure it out. So thank goodness for technology. I mean, that's really allowed us to, to keep moving forward. Because I don't, honestly, I don't know, um, you know, what, you know, like I said, what, how do you handle a sophisticated piece of machinery when you're not the one that's got the expertise to specifically know how to troubleshoot certain, you know, elements of it when you're trying to get it going or something like that? And I think, Jeremy, on the, on the kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, there's so many pieces of equipment that require startup that are super simple. And I think the technology has allowed us to do that in a really efficient way that we can maybe expedite some components of startup in a, in a better way than we've historically, you know, gotten on site. And it's the, you know, it's the 20 minute safety meeting followed by, you know, introductions followed by a coffee break followed by this. And, you know, a, a, an hour exercise is an eight hour day. Right. And so I think we can really streamline some some of the aspects of startup to to really benefit everybody. Yeah, it's a great point. Maybe kind of uh, broadening back out then, you know, what we heard from Cabri a little bit about, about impacts on staff and, you know, thinking about staffing in the construction industry and how we deal with mental health. Um, you know, what impacts have you seen on your staff from COVID and, and how have you helped your staff address these impacts? I, I, I can jump in here. Uh, we It's been really significantly impacted our organization. We've lost some close colleagues. Uh, we've all shared this industry and, and personally some employees uh, this year. So it's been really, really hard on our organization. Um, 
you know, the, the mental health component of, of what's going on is, is really, really uh, understated. I don't think you could put enough emphasis on it. So we've really, in our, in our weekly meetings, have had not only our, our safety protocols for our job sites, but really uh, started adding a, a health and personal safety kind of discussion. Like, what are you doing for yourself this week, right? What are, what kind of, you know, for me, it, it's really important that people are exercising to some degree. Exercise is a huge way to deal with anxiety, depression, uh, all the things that are uh, coming through in, in this mental illness of the people don't really understand. They haven't talked about it. They don't understand it. Uh, you know, just getting out and going for a walk, you know, go for a half an hour walk a day uh, can really help a lot of people. So uh, just adding some of those elements into the, the daily discussions of our meetings help a lot. Yeah. And, and, you know, we see the same thing where people have worries and concerns about COVID and getting it and passing it on to somebody else and, and just creates a stress within them. And the other side of it is we have individuals that frankly aren't worried about it, don't believe in the measures that are put in place. And so we have some division among folks. And so some of the ways we've addressed it is first of all, you know, as management, we have to have compassion for everybody. We have to understand that everybody comes from a different background. They have different health risks. They have, they, they may be associated with people with heavy health risks. So we need to have compassion for people that have worries and concerns. Um, secondly, we encourage whatever possible for people to work from home. And I think that's pretty standard. Um, and then third, we remind everybody that, that the measures in place are not only for at work, that when we, when we talk to them about, the, about implementing the measures, that you have to implement them at home so that we don't bring it to the workplace. And then I think finally, um, we, we spend a lot of time making sure we're leading by example and that we're following the, the measures that are out there. And that provides comfort to those that are worried and concerned. Thanks, Jeff. Jeremy, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd add in a little. I think, um, you know, obviously this experience has evolved over time as we've learned more and figured out how to deal with things. I think initially, um, you know, it's, uh, over engagement and communication to connect with people because, you know, things were very isolating and, and especially for, you know, maybe office staff that, that it, were used to coming in and were, were not able to do that. I think uh, connecting with them on a regular basis, check-ins, you know, there was a lot of that going on early, early on as, as, you know, people had kind of really abrupt change in their lives as, uh, associated with working from home. And, you know, I know, you know, we said, hey, it's been great. I haven't had to commute. I haven't had to get on an airplane since the spring. And, um, but the downside of that maybe is that some people are isolated because they're, you know, whatever for, for their personal circumstance. So the, the need to really be proactive and, and making sure people know that, hey, you're important to us and we're going to, we're going to stay engaged with what's going on with you is, I think, been something I've observed and, and participated in. I think it's really, been helpful um, to kind of keep things going. I think we also um, like not only in uh, like not on construction sites, but also on construction sites, recognizing um, this, the whole pandemic, one of the things that it's taken away from all of us is our ability to socially interact like normally. And there was a phrase that, that uh, you hear a lot um, the social distancing, we need to do social distancing. And, and I think we kind of decided, you know, that I don't really like that term. So, so we started referring to it as physical distancing because we don't want to lose the social part of what it means to be a, a person. And, and um, but recognizing that we do need to have space to be safe. And so really emphasizing that difference um, and then trying to find ways to, to be engaged in building team teamwork and, and working together while being physically separate is, is, is certainly a challenge. Um, you know, and so I think that's, you know, just trying to think, you know, think differently about how you go about um, day to day. I know we like, you know, in order to keep people safe, we had tried to establish like kind of quote unquote work family, work, work pod and like certain groups of people would use the same set of tools so that you could try to keep some 
separation and isolation. Obviously, there's lots more things you got to do around uh, sanitation and all that sort of thing. So there's just a lot of different uh, elements to it that are challenging to try to figure out. Thanks, Jeremy and Jeff, you, you guys both brought up the kind of the health and safety of their employees on the job site, you know, outside of the some of the things we're all familiar with social distancing masks. Uh, anything specific you've done to, to make sure your employees are safe as they continue to work on our, our essential projects? Uh, well, so temperature checks are, you know, have always been a big thing, making sure that, that you're checking the temperature of everybody every day. But we found that's not as accurate as just talking to the folks and asking them how they're feeling, uh, spending the time with them to, to just ensure that if they're not feeling well, we have the ability to follow up with them and, and just make sure that, that they're getting the, the care that they needed. Uh, we've added some air purifiers in projects in the project trailers. And then when we have enclosed spaces, we'll put purifiers in there or make sure we have ventilation fans that keep the air moving and, and so it doesn't build up in, in a room. Uh, and you know, obviously we need to make sure we have people that are enforcing the, the, the rules. So we have superintendents and site safety personnel that are responsible for just ensuring that the either social slash physical distancing is being maintained and if, if there are people getting close together, that they're wearing their masks. Um, and then, you know, lastly, right now, we're, we're kind of enforcing a rule that you have to have a negative test for COVID before returning to work. Jeremy, anything you'd like to add there? You know, I, 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 again, I think it's been one of adapting to what you, what you are learning about all of this. I mean, certainly earlier on, we, there were different measures and, and then as, our state governments or local whatever jurisdictions have made decisions about what you can and can't do. I mean, you know, it, it evolved from, yeah, maybe we'd have some people in, in offices. Okay, maybe we can't do that for a while. Um, we could ride in cars together with masks on. Maybe we shouldn't do that anymore, depending on, you know, keeping distance. So I think it's just being nimble and, and, uh, and always kind of keeping you know, people's safety in mind and, and recognizing that, yeah, this is a burden. Because I mean, I think the, the, the COVID fatigue factor is is clearly a thing. And, you know, and, and again, you want to fall into your typical social habits of interacting with people. And so it's just repeatedly reinforcing why um, we're doing what we're doing is, is, you know, it's just like an ongoing battle, basically. And I can add to that too. I think one of the things is really creating a culture where it's it's safe to 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 say how you're feeling, right? I think we we've been to some sites where it's clear that there's a culture that maybe the the staff doesn't feel comfortable, whether it's from pressure to deliver the project on time or to get off a project or to just some other reason that's driving them. But for some reason, they want to push the the envelope of how they're feeling to to get the work done that day versus you know, hey, what? It's okay. You're not feeling today well today. Let's protect the greater team here in the project and and take a step back and, and make sure we're protecting everybody's health and safety. So, I think just creating that culture that it's on a site is really important because it's it's not 100 percent consistent across projects. Great, thanks, Joe. I want to uh, switch gears a little bit here, and, and this is a question that came in actually when we had we had prepped for. Um, can you talk a little bit about the impacts we've seen on the supply chain from COVID? You know, what have we done to overcome these impacts? And, and maybe if you could, you know, what are we seeing now and what do you expect into the future? Uh, Joe, maybe you could kick us off on this from your perspective. Yeah, so it's, it's really been an interesting response and it's, I'd say there's been different phases of it. Um, early on, there were, where there was a lot of initial reactions uh, to COVID based upon what people may have predicted economically to come out of it. So there are some early reactions that have happened that really made communication really hard. You know, people went remote right away. Um, certain manufacturers furloughed certain pieces of staff or production. Um, th that's all kind of settled back out now. And I think people have been, uh, actually there's, there's an increase in response time on a certain level because people are more available. They're in, they're in front of their computer on Zoom or on their telephone versus traveling. So there's, there's some improved performance that way. Uh, I would say generally there's probably a four to six week delay in the entire delivery between 
contract and, and equipment showing up on site generally to what it historically has been. Uh, but still the major component is that startup element. You know, we can still get submittals done fairly, you know, timely. And I, and I guess I should, I should digress and kind of chuckle like equipment suppliers are always late. So this hasn't really changed a lot. <laughs> um, but seriously, it's a, uh, it's been a challenge to some regard, but, you know, really on the, on the tail end, just that coordination of startup and getting people to job sites has really been the most difficult part of this. Thanks, Joe. Jeff, so, any, any thoughts? Yeah. So for the most part, we're getting bids still from suppliers and we, we wondered if we might be impacted in that way, but the bids we're getting, the, the vendors aren't, aren't uh, committing to delivery times. They won't commit to the delivery required for the project because they just don't know if COVID could impact their, their pro or their, their delivery. So when you combine that with the facts that many contracts now, many of the new contracts we're seeing coming out, no longer consider COVID as a force majeure event, it puts us in a difficult position where we still have to hold to the schedule of the contract, but the vendors won't sign up for it. So it's something we're trying to figure out how to deal with and, um, and it's gonna to continue to change as COVID continues to change. Uh, when it comes to submittals, we're finding a little bit of delay. We don't know if that's from folks working from home and not being as efficient, but we're concerned that the, those submittal delays could, in the end, end up in a delay in the delivery of the equipment. Uh, and then the other thing is we oftentimes talk about the big equipment that, that forces the job, but we're having a hard time getting some of the smaller equipment, some of the small tools and supplies, the grout that we used to be able to go get in a day or in a couple of days now takes up to a couple of weeks to get just with delayed deliveries. So those are some of the impacts we're having. Thanks, Jeff. Jeremy, any final thoughts here? I I think probably similar experiences of just more uncertainty. And it is kind of like Jeff said, it, it tends to be the thing that maybe you don't think about that you have an issue with. And it's oftentimes something that's a that small piece of the puzzle that you need that, that uh, really ends up tripping you up, something that wasn't really expected. Um, so I think that's probably all I'd say about it as far as my experience. Well, maybe to build on this, this is a question from the audience. Um, what adjustments have you seen manufacturers making during co the COVID pandemic to insulate the supply chain risks? And has local manufacturing wrapped, ramped up as a consequence of that? Jeremy, maybe any thoughts from your end? Oh, man, I don't, honestly, I'm not really sure what, what local manufacturing we are dealing with these days, to tell you the truth. I mean, certainly we're working harder to identify more than one supplier um, and, and thinking of, and even digging in with them as what, where the, what their supply chain looks like. And, you know, like, is, is their pipe being produced in the U S versus out of, out of the U S and what, what's the impact um, potentially on delivery or, you know, sometimes maybe it's, it has nothing to do with manufacturing. It could be a customs issue where it just would sit, for an extended period of time because of lack of resources or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, I can't speak, I can't speak to local manufacturing, uh, changes from what I've observed at least, but, uh, but certainly you're asking a lot more questions and trying to make sure you, you know, to the best of our ability, can you pin down anything? Can you get an answer? Um, and, and also our, we're looking at schedule what's, you know, do you need to pull stuff forward in the schedule to try to give yourself more more time to allow for the uncertainty? Jeff, any thoughts? I think you pretty well nailed it. Uh, you know, we we spend a lot of time communicating now, and a lot of emails and a lot of confirmations about where things are at. And then, you know, as Jeremy said, we we often develop a plan, a workaround. So, for example, with piping, or if it, if a pump might be coming in late, we'll be forced to put the piping in before the pump comes when we would typically like to set the pump and build out from, from the pump. So we're developing contingency plans for uh, variances and delivery dates. Great. Maybe, um, Jeff, you talked a little bit about force majeure and that kind of leads into the next question we got from the audience. What types, of, uh, what types and magnitudes of cost impacts are we seeing and how are you managing that contractually with clients? 
uh, both on new projects and on existing projects that may have started, you know, as this was ramping up or even before this? So I, I think the number one thing is, is we're communicating with owners about potential impacts. Um, we, we, I don't know that we've really seen uh, cost impacts per se in regard to equipment and, and some supplies. Those vary over time, no matter what. We have seen production impacts where crews aren't as efficient as they've, they have been in the past, uh, not being able to work in close proximity or if they do wearing masks and just the time it takes to plan and work in this new environment. Um, the, 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 the times where we lose individuals on the job site due to COVID uh, has an impact. I, I think I mentioned earlier that we had three people come down with COVID on a job site. So we shut that job site down for two weeks uh, which had an impact on schedule, which in turn will have an impact on Scott on cost by us accelerating to make up for it. So, uh, but when it comes to like the force majeure events, we're, we're communicating frequently upfront with owners to ensure they know about the impacts. And, and our experience to date is, is if you're upfront and, you know, aren't trying to make profit off, off something like that, but just be open and honest about the situation. Owners have been good to work with us on, modifying schedules to accommodate the delays that have occurred. Thanks, Jeff. Jeremy, you're, you're heavily involved in kind of upfront pieces of projects. Any thoughts from your end on this? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that there's been any noticeable impact, again, to, to cost. There's always different factors going into what's driving, you know, an issue. I mean, you're, you're in, and then as far as, um, you know, Jeff made the comment about kind of, we have, we're having to internalize, uh, the impact of COVID potential impact of COVID, I guess, um, uh, because of this exclusion from force majeure. So you're definitely starting to see that. And, and I, I even remember fielding a call from, a uh, an owner early in, in on with real, you know, sig significant concerns over, you know, what happens if sort of thing and how do I protect myself? And, and, you know, and so it's, you know, I think it's important, again, the communication and the understanding from both sides as to what the impacts could be. Um, and, and so just working, working through it um, is, is important and, and to, to keep on the same page. But um, yeah, like I said, I, I don't, you know, obviously there's, there, there is a lot more planning that has to happen. And, but I, at the same time, I think we've ramped up our ability to, you know, it used to be, you know, early on, like, okay, what do I need? Like, just what do I need to put in place to make people safe? Now that's sort of understood, like, okay, we need this, you know, we need this kind of PPE, we need this kind of sanitation, we need, we need extra, you know, workforce uh, in order to keep hygiene up in this on the site to a different standard than we did before. Uh, maybe we, don't do as much inside a trailer, whatever. I mean, there's different things that you've kind of figured out. And so now we're sort of normalized that a little bit. Um, and, and so I don't know, you know, again, it kind of depends on where you were at in the cycle of your project when this happened. Um, and I think the, that, uh, you know, so that obviously drove sort of what we needed to do, you know, depending on what was, what was going on when this kind of all happened. Thanks, Jeremy. Joe, any thoughts from the kind of manufacturing side? Are we seeing changes in equipment pricing or has it been pretty steady as well? You know, I think there's been some material cost increases uh, on the raw material side of things for, for the manufacturers. But I think generally there's there's kind of a, a vacuum created and, and kind of projects that were anticipated to happen this year that maybe got pushed a little bit. So I think generally the manufacturers have seen kind of a decline in their in their revenue over the over the year. Um, so I think they've been trying to balance their raw material costs with, you know, I think they're, they're generally hungry for work and trying to fill their factories and keep their staff working and, you know, keep their production levels up. So they're, they're trying to balance that. So I think it's kind of maybe held some of the pricing a little more consistent throughout the year than we normally would have seen. Um, but other than that, I haven't seen significant changes now. Okay. Maybe a, a quick question here from the audience, then we'll go to the final question that we've kind of planned out. Um, so let's keep this one short. H have we seen any issues in bid responsiveness from either suppliers or subcontractors? 
Jeff, maybe you want to kick us off and then we'll go Joe and Jeremy. No, we've, we've uh, had really good response. Pretty straightforward answer. Joe, any, uh, any troubles on your end getting back to bids or, or being as responsive as you normally were? No, um, pretty, pretty business as usual for us actually. Okay. Jeremy. Well, I don't have a long track record of dealing with bids prior to COVID. So, um, but from my experience thus far, it seems like people are every bit as responsive. And in fact, maybe early on, like uh, when there was a lot more concern about where the economy might be going, uh, I think people, uh, maybe we saw some bids that were lower than expected because some of our trade partners were trying to just secure more work for their people and just kind of, you know, going after things a little bit more aggressively. Um, I don't know that that's even the case anymore. I think things have kind of just, again, stabilized and, uh, but there's, you know, and again, I think fortunately for, for us, uh, the water wastewater sector has been extremely active. I mean, there's no shortage of work out there. Um, and so if anything, I think it's putting pressure like workforce and, and maybe I haven't seen it yet. I don't know what Jeff's perspective is, but maybe some of the sectors that have been hit harder, will, will, you know, will we see migration of, of trade partners into our space to, to looking for work? I, I, like I said, I haven't witnessed that myself yet, but I could imagine that scenario. I know back in like 08, when we had the uh, downturn, a lot of, um, you know, developer type uh, efforts since a lot of the housing market went on hold were, you know, kind of transitioned into public sector work. Um, so I don't, like I said, I haven't seen that quite yet, but I, I can imagine that would be a logical thing to happen. Um, but, the, but again, there's, there's a, a lot of activity still. Um, so I think that's, that's the good news as far as what's going on. Great. So maybe as our uh, closing question here, um, you know, if, if owners and engineers were going to take away kind of one piece of information from this discussion or the experience we've had over the last almost year now, um, you know, what, what what would that be from your perspective? How do we how do we continue to make this better, building on what we've learned from the past year? Uh, Jeremy, we'll start with you, and then Jeff, and then Joe. Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> um, there's. Well, I would say there's nothing that can can replace in-person interaction. As much as it's been handy to have Zoom calls and Teams and whatever the heck different uh, video conferencing system you like to use, it's not the same as being able to sit down in a room and look over a drawing together and and talk about what's going on. I mean, we've all been very adaptive uh, adaptive to this situation and it's been great, um, but technology has its limits and, and the, the social component of how we do our business, uh, it, it will be great when that is able to come back to normal. So that's certainly a, a lesson learned for me and something that I would, you know, I hope, so I, I guess I'm saying that so far as like, I don't, I hope for, you know, our owners and engineers don't feel real comfortable doing this all the time and, and want to just only do teams calls. And I'm like, we need to get together in person. So. Great. Jeff. Uh, I, I think we just need to realize that we're not done with COVID. You know what? Hopefully we're on the, the downhill side of things, but we're going to continue to have the potential for some production impacts, loss of folks on site, uh, the potential for equipment delays, depending on what happens, and that we just need to continue to communicate and be open and fair with how we deal with it, that we're all striving for the same objective, which is to deliver a project while keeping everybody safe. Great. Joe? Yeah, no, I think uh, I think the guys hit it pretty well. And I think just moving forward, I think, you know, the social distancing, and, and I like the way Jeremy put it, physical distancing, it is really going to potentially carry on longer, right? And there's there's been some some maybe some neglected things within the plants, 
where, where folks haven't been able to get together to execute certain projects or repairs or so there's work that's not getting accomplished and just be thinking about what's coming down in the pipeline moving forward of things that have been put off because of our distancing and, and ability to interact and work closely together. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, each of you for your participation in this. It was great to get the different perspectives and, and really enlightening, at least for me, I know, uh, understanding kind of where everyone's coming from and, and how this looks a little different for each of our different industries. So um, we're going to take a 10 minute break here. We'll be back together at 1040 Pacific time or 1140 Mountain time. Uh, but as we do that, I want to just thank our sponsors again, our gold sponsors, Brown and Caldwell, Carollo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Sladen, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy Jenks. And then our silver sponsors, Stantec, Tanemic, Honeycuts, James W. Fowler Company, and ESI Construction. Uh, thanks everyone for sponsoring this, and we will see everyone in about 10 minutes. <laughs>